morning, good evening, good afternoon. I would like to welcome everybody who is attending this session and those who will be watching the recording of our live session. My name is Lela Machaidze. I am project management professional and I am in this field for more than 70 years. I'm working for public and private sectors and I'm really passionate about anything related about project management, business management. And if you want to learn more about me, you can visit my social media network where I put interesting tips and tricks about project management, leadership and business. Uh, Couple words about today's agenda and logistics. Today's session will take one hour, approximately one hour. The first 20, 25 minutes will be presentation by our honorable guest. Then we will have Q and A session. I have a couple of questions uh, for Alexandre and then uh, feel free actually to post your questions during the presentation. We will be addressing all of those questions after the presentation. Uh, we will be recording and we are recording this session and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel so you can watch it later or share with your colleagues and friends. So with this, this is my pleasure and honor to start our session, next session about digital transformation and specifically what digital transformation causes to corporate corporations in sense of the corporate risk management. And I'm really thrilled to present Alexandre from Brazil. And he's a subject matter of expert in supply management, in logistics, and author of five best selling books out of which three of them are about digital transformation. And I'm really, really happy to have him on this session. Hi, Alexandre, how are you doing today? Thank you. Hi, Lela, how are you? Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I see Georgie is also around. Uh, yes. Nice to uh, meet you, um, uh, although uh, through the web. And the idea today is to, to share some uh, high-level thoughts. And ideally, uh, I'll be able to provoke some, some insights so we can, uh, we can discuss later, OK? Excellent, excellent. Um, if you agree, I may share my presentation and start Please go ahead, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Just a second. Um, okay. I, I believe you, you, you are now seeing my presentation, right? Right, we see your presentation clearly. Okay, great. Uh, what's, what's the idea for today? We are, we are talking a little bit about digital transformation, a little bit about corporate risk management, though uh, corporate governance. And we are trying to bring those two disciplines and see them through the eyes of a uh, board, okay? So uh, I will start with a more um, general concept approach, and then we'll drive into uh, the board level perspective, okay? Fine. Um, okay, what is digital transformation about? Um, I like to start discussing the, the idea of the virtual cycle, okay? And how, how do we start? The first point is to identify our key clients or our key customers. If, um, if you're talking about key clients, should be uh, both internal clients and external clients, and then try to understand, to visualize, to identify their unmet needs. Okay, that's uh, the, the trigger for digital transformation, our 
key clients unmet needs. So let's pick up an example. Here there is a, a um, well-known shipping company, Maersk, and one of their uh, most valuable assets are the reefer containers, those that I use to transport goods with controlled temperature, okay? Now, um, what are the departments within Maersk that are the clients um, from, from the management of those assets? We have the maintenance team, we have the operations team, we have the finance team, and why is that? Uh, every, uh, imagine that you need to uh, inspect every single reefer container when they get to their uh, destination port. Before they go to a second trip, they need to be inspected. So the maintenance, maintenance team uh, has a lot of work on that. In the operations team, they, they must have those containers available. Um, what's the quantity to be available where and to attend which customers in different parts of the globe. In the finance team, they will look at those containers as a fixed capital. Oh, I need to put a lot of money on those assets to make my business run. Okay, so what would be um, unmet needs for those areas? Well, the maintenance team would like to have less volume of work. The operations team would like to have more availability of containers. And the finance team would like to have their, their fixed costs reduced. Okay, so we are talking business. We're not talking about technology here. Fine, what would be a, um, a uh, adequate value proposition in this situation? Uh, imagine the digital transformation leader comes to those guys, the maintenance guy, the operations vice president, the, the CFO and say, okay, I can reduce the frequency and the length, the duration of each inspection. I can improve your assets availability and I can postpone new refers acquisition and deal with more uh, business volume with the very same assets that we have today. Okay, well, that, that sounds good. Uh, but how do we do this? What's the business model that should be around that? Imagine, for example, uh, I'll try to uh, draw it here for you. Uh, imagine that we have this uh, container here. Sorry for the very bad drawing. And this container will, will have lots of sensors here. Okay, we have those sensors and those sensors will be sent to one big, say, um, data lake. And this data lake will receive uh, the evaluation from a machine learning algorithm. Okay, this machine learning algorithm, after analyzing this data, will create, will build what we call a predictive model. And this predictive model will recommend, recommend um, to inspect or not the container that is arriving into a port. And based on what? On well, the performance of the internal equipment of the container, they will be, they will be monitored during the, 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 the transit time and the algorithm will analyze the performance and will recommend the maintenance team the following. Listen, you don't need to inspect now. Well, if I don't need to inspect the period with, from the refer arrival in the port till it's available for the next trip will be shortened. Therefore, you will increase availability and you will not need a second refer to be available while this first one is being maintained. Okay, so, uh, and now imagine that this recommendation occurs within weeks or months in advance. Listen, uh, that container will not require any maintenance for the next couple of weeks, for the next six weeks. So the entire business will change. And now we are talking about a data strategy. Listen, um, identify key clients, understand their needs, define a value proposition, think about a business model, use real-time data gathering, you know, from weekly invoices, and this is the data strategy. At the end of that, we think about technology. 
technology selection will be the enabler. You use technology to make the business model run, a business model that will deliver a value proposition to satisfy your customers. Okay, here we may have Internet of Things, RPA, Robotic Process Automation, we may have uh, Machine Learning, which is an application of artificial intelligence, but it's not about technology. And here, we've just seen one example from Maersk. There are many others. Um, IKEA is working on blockchain to growth sales. Uh, GE Aviation is working on IoT and machine learning to reduce the time for accounts receivable. Unilever is working on digital twins to enhance production management. Uh, at the end, we may have time to go through those examples, okay? Now, um, to make that happen, a company must look at uh, several domains of influence. Those nine domains of influence include the global and the economic structure, uh, firms sector conjuncture. You need to look at long-term corporate strategies, short-term business objectives. You need to understand how to manage your assets, like the example we've just seen with Maersk, and you need to take into account what are the legacy systems. You must consider the maturity of your internal and external processes. You look at the organizational structure and knowledge, you look at the available and selected, because those are different things, available and selected technological mix. And finally, you need to look at your viable data strategy. Fine. If we know about that, we know how to do this. If the company has the proper savviness on that, we go towards corporate digital literacy. But what savviness is? Savviness is the ability to make good judgments, okay? Uh, when we think about each of these nine domains, there are many disciplines that are involved. For example, when we think here about global and local economic structure, uh, we're, to, to understand global economic structure, we're talking about economics, yeah, but also about social sciences, maps, philosophy, history, geography. If we look at firms short term conjuncture, you know, the sectors conjuncture, we are looking about, we're looking on business management, finance, statistics, politics, again, social sciences. Fine. What, what's our goal today? We, we need to pick one of them. Okay. And uh, we, we need to understand that the ultimate goal is guarantee firms long term existence. All right. Those nine domains, they must be seen from the perspective of intersectionality, which means they all go together. One will influence each other. And this intersectionality will demand a transdisciplinary approach. We need to look at them simultaneously. But today we have one focus. We'll look at long-term corporate strategies. And why is that? because here we have the predominance of the discipline of corporate governance. Thus, we talk about corporate risk management, okay? So we are now going down to the topic of the, of the session. All right, when we think about corporate risk management, there are four major categories, okay? Uh, we talk about external risks, process risks, strategy and information risks and financial risks. If we go and detail all of them, we have, um, I would say some, approximately some 50 different types of risks that firms may be exposed to, okay? So in these times, when you think about changing processes and business models because of digital transformation and the intersectionality of all those nine domains, we need to reassess those risks. The firms, the companies must have the ability to reassess risks. And why is that? To deliver proper digital literacy and assure long-term existence, okay? Now, let's see a few examples. Um, looking at 
digital transformation risk categories. And we'll now try to bridge up the concepts, okay? Those are some of the 50 types of risks uh, I had mentioned previously. Cybersecurity, strategy risks, reputational stakeholders, competition, technology, people, regulatory and financial, okay? Now we have nine of those risks. Okay, let's think about one event. All right, the use of digital assets. Um, per digital assets, we may understand, um, for example, cryptocurrencies, okay? Um, we already have countries with their national cryptocurrencies, okay? Now, um, from the perspective of uh, the CFO, now think you are now one CFO and you need to use digital assets for a host of investment, uh, operational and transactional purposes, okay? Uh, what, what type of risks will you be exposed to? In the first moment, obviously we think about finance risk, fair enough. But at the same time, we are also exposed to regulatory risk. And why is that uh, here? Why is that here we, we have both a national and international regulations? And not all of them, in fact, very few of them are crystal clear so far. So if I, I decide to hedge some of my investments based on this or that cryptocurrency. We, we, we used to talk about Bitcoin, but it's only one of, you know, one out of tens of different crypto coins. Uh, but if I want to buy some uh, national cryptocurrency, um, what's the certainty related to the return on investment or the security uh, I can give to my stakeholders? Imagine, oh, sorry, imagine, for example, um, how some of your stakeholders will feel if your CFO is now uh, using digital assets to hold, for example, uh, several transactional purpose with a few suppliers. Um, what will be the market perception? What will be your investors' perception? What will be your customers' perception? So you have a very close relationship between stakeholders and the reputational risks here. What, um, how, how, how exposed am I to fraud? How exposed am I? Oh, you're using cryptocurrency. Um, I've heard that cryptocurrency is uh, supporting activities based on child labor, on slavery. Are we exposed to cyber attacks? And those risks may be real or maybe a perception. So if one CFO decides to go through this way, all this environment must be uh, considered. Then we think about data security, okay? Uh, cybersecurity is an issue and we usually think about the technological perspective, okay? We need to protect and, but one, key important thing, we, we, we must know that uh, two thirds of all information leakage comes either from our employee employers or third party service providers that we hire. Two thirds of our information leakage do not occur due to external exposure, but internal. So we need the right culture. We need training. We need to talk about people. Data security is about technology, sure, but it's also about people, okay? Uh, imagine the risk if uh, your customer personal data is um, available to the market, you, you let it leak. What's the cost to recover your image? So you also have a reputational exposure here. Another example, you, you work in a very traditional company, one of those companies that are incumbents in, in your market for the last uh, couple of decades, maybe 
more than a century, and and then you are facing a asset light asset light challenger, a a company known as Digital Native, and they have very low assets. Okay, uh, I, I am being challenged, so I'll think about competition. Okay, that's a a competition risk, but. We, we could go two ways here. Uh, what's the impact of this competition risk? What, what are the financial risks associated? What, what's the exposition leverage to revenue loss, to market share loss, um, to missing the right revenue channels? Okay, that, that's one perspective. The second perspective, when a digital native is challenging your business, you, you need to think about your strategy. First, uh, what have I missed? What, what's happened in my strategy manage, management in the last couple of years that gave enough space to this digital native to come on board, okay? And then review it, but review from which perspectives? Um, what are the, the revenue channels? What are, what's my pricing strategy? What's my target consumer? Uh, what are my target consumer unmet needs? What's the value proposition I should deliver to them? So uh, you see there is a, a, a bunch of impacts here. Therefore, after that, we'll think about technology. Remember, technology is the enabler. Um, it's not because you're being challenged by a digital native that you need to buy technology. You need to think business and then understand how technology will uh, help you the turnover. And after that, we come to people, okay? Because um, it's people that will um, acquire, use technology. It's people that will run your business. It's all about people here, okay? Now, one last uh, one last example before we we approach the to the disclosure. Okay, um, the board of directors is now uh, thinking about um, creating a new job, a new position, which is the chief digital transformation officer. Okay, say so, well, but why the board of directors? It, it, it's a, a matter of people. I'll talk to the human resources vice president if I, I'm a large company. Uh, it's about hiring. No, it's not only about hiring. It's about why hiring. Uh, and it's not all about people. It's more about a strategy. Let, let's think um, about the, the role of a chief digital transformation officer and compare it to the role of a chief information officer. This is a very traditional position, right? Okay, uh, maybe we, we could think on um, what they do. The chief, the, ah, the CIO, the CIO, what do they do? They protect data. That, that's what they know how to do. The CDTO, they use data. Okay, that's not much difference, but maybe we, we think why they do that, okay? Uh, they want to use data to have business growth. Okay, why do I protect that? Uh, to avoid external risks, um, to guarantee that people follow procedures. So the CIO is looking inside. It's a internal perspective. The CDTO uh, it has a internal and external perception. Okay, but one, one more level here. Um, say how they do that. Okay, this business growth because they want to deliver a new value proposition, proposition to, to whom? To a target uh customer okay so it's a business level approach and how will i do that um maybe i i, I will enhance 
technology. I will enhance technology to protect data, avoid risks, guarantee procedures, um, uh, impede internal violations. Okay, it's one perspective. A second perspective is I want to deliver a new value proposition, target, com target customers, guarantee business growth, therefore I use new data, and then I need a CIO to help me with that. But listen, if the board is hiring a CDTO, it, it, it's the easy, we can't follow the easiest way, which is to assign the CIO to the digital transformation venture. Those positions, they, they are conflictuous. We need different people for those two positions. So we are here talking about a strategy. It's not all about people, it's also about strategy. And obviously, at the end of the day, we'll think about technology and how I will compete in the market because this perspective is about competition. The CIO do not have the skills to see and understand competition, but the CDTO has to do that. Okay, guys, what do we have now? We have all those corporate risks, the very same name that we had as always, but in a different context. And what do I usually suggest companies to do? Look at, um, try to create a digital transformation committee. And this digital transformation committee will be working together with the board of directors, but not to drive innovation. The, the mission of the Digital Transformation Committee is not to promote digital transformation, is not to promote innovation. Here, for this, you'll have your C-level. You'll have a great R&D vice president. You'll have a great innovation director. But the transformation, the Digital Transformation Committee will be there to see risks. It's a risk management strategy. Maybe one of the risks assigned, identified, is the, the risk of uh, obsolete technology, the risk of uh, lack of innovation within the culture of the company. Okay, this is a type of risk that will not be addressed by the committee, but the C-level, the C-suite, okay? Now, uh, this is the, the broad structure. One more minute, I'll be finishing. This is the broad structure. We think about a digital transformation committee working um, as a supporting team to the board of directors. Um, they will be usually formed by a leader, ideally an external member. And here we have the CDTO, also the CIO, someone to represent the shareholder's voice, usually um, this one will, will be uh, a little bit more conservative, okay? And um, it's also very important to have someone to represent the sector's voice, an external representative um, that has some knowledge, some digital literacy knowledge, and will be able to, um, to help here. So as a uh, closing remark, you will remember the nine domains of influence that I have shared with you in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, I mentioned about uh, savviness, which is the ability to make good judgments, but how savviness actually gets into this structure. The real savviness will come through this senior structure, the Digital Transformation Committee, okay? Therefore, will drive the company through the journey of corporate digital literacy. And this will be one of the pillars of long-term existence. I'm not saying that leading digital transformation is the unique, the only, or the most important uh, element, but it's definitely an element that cannot be neglected. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, thank you. I, I believe I have... Uh, Go on a few minutes beyond my limits. I'm sorry. And
I'm no glad problem. To... It was really interesting. It was really uh, to the point explaining uh, the areas of influence and the, what risks are emerging. And thank you so much. And I would like to encourage everybody, please feel free to post your questions in the chat section and we will be addressing them during our uh, this session, Q&A session. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alexandra. It was very interesting and to the point, but as soon as you started the conversation and as soon as you listed all these nine domains of influence, I was like uh, shocked about the volume, how much information, how much judgment and work should be done uh, before we make any type of uh, decision. So we know that time is uh, like flies and uh, the corporations need to make decisions quickly, especially about DT and any risks related to the DT really are important to make just quick, quickly. So what do you think, what would be the best probably recommendation to prioritize for corporations? And this will be two approach, one for corporation, big, huge companies, and the second for the smaller companies who are more flexible and more agile. What would be your recommendation? Where to start for corporations okay. and small companies, mid level companies. Okay. Th there is a broad template named uh, the Digital Transformation Roadmap. Um, it has four pillars, okay? The first pillar is known the Value Proposition Roadmap. Then you have the Business Model Roadmap, then Data Strategy Roadmap, and finally the Technology Roadmap. When, when we're talking about a large company, one that is, for example, multinational, many sites. Uh, they usually go through, they start through this first pillar, the value proposition roadmap. You actually will hire someone to play the role of the digital transformation leader. Um, you will assess the entire organization and select the quick wins. And for example, they will build a center of excellence, for example, bringing together the, uh, the CFO and the supply chain director, because this digital transformation leader acknowledged that in the finance area, in the supply chain area, are the, the best short-term opportunities related to this digital transformation roadmap. So they will start this way. That's a corporate approach. Then a second option, we look at the business model roadmap, which a department, which is a department level approach. And even in very large companies, it will occur the second approach because um, many large companies are not yet aware of the needs of digital transformation. And they will, you will find one department leader very keen on that. And for example, the, I, I know one guy He's um, the, the human resources and the legal director of a major food company here in Brazil. And it's a Mexican company, a large company. And they decided to start digital transformation in the human resources department. Not because it was a, a corporate strategy, but he believed there were gains in there. And then he became the, the evangelist for digital transformation within the company. So we may have the corporate approach, we may have the department approach. The other two, um, the other two roadmaps, data strategy and technology, they come after, they are enablers. So you either choose the corporate approach or department level, and then you think about uh, data strategy and technology. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you talked about different risks in different, like five, uh, nine digital uh, transformation risk areas. And the first was the cybersecurity. And after all, you described the CIO and the digital transformation chief officer role, and still the cybersecurity stays with the, the, the CIO role, right? Uh, 
So how this is, and the, the committee is the one who really works on identifying the risks. How this relationship will work with CIO and the committee and the chief uh, uh, digital transformation officer? They, they, they should go together. Um, when I showed the digital transformation committee structure, they are both there the digital transformation leader and the technology information leader. They are both in the, in the, in the committee. And, and why is that? Cybersecurity is about protection, which is the domain of knowledge of the CIO. But at the same time, this very company will be pursuing initiatives uh, to grow in the market, to have a closer relationship with customers, to move from only B2B transactions to add, not to necessarily to change, but to add B2C transaction. Therefore, the digital transformation leader will foster for more openness in the data relationship, which exposes to risk and require security. So digital transformation leader and CIO should go together. Um, when we think about uh, traditional external risks, cybersecurity external risks, such as malware, ransomware, spyware. Um, it's not in the DNA of the digital transformation leader to know how to protect. He wants this to be, he wants to be an internal client of someone who is assuring data protection and data protection against malware, ransomware, spyware will come from the CIO. The CIO will say, listen, digital transformation leader, go, what you need, go and do what you need to do to make our company grow, because I will keep the environment safe. And they, and they have to work together. So do we need to have uh, the, the same position in the government sector? What do you think? Um, could, could in the government this, sector, please? so uh, in public sector, for example, uh, in government sector, in government agencies, do we need to have such such positions? You know, uh, many countries are now working on um, their own cryptocurrencies. Uh, therefore, they are studying how to use. Um, a broad set of technologies named blockchain. Blockchain, in fact, is an ecosystem with several um, features that make this um, complex structure to work. And um, what, what are the two key um, drivers in the public sector? First, uh, make sure they have all the data of their citizens available and secure, usually to cross-check the revenues and charge more taxes, okay? And second, um, they're working on cryptocurrencies. Uh, if we think from a more philosophical perspective, um, machine learning, RPA, um, blockchain, are the pillars to eliminate corruption. Uh, you, you can create a corruption-free environment in the public sector, but only when the digital transformation initiatives in the public sector are directed to that goal. In the short term, they want to control people, to control our revenues, tax us more, and why they want to create their own uh, cryptocurrencies uh, to tax more so or to avoid um, taxation leakage okay so there is a, a huge area in the public sector that will be in the agenda for the next three or four decades it's, it's a, a long-term learning curve
And so if we look at still, I'm thinking if we look at the, each of the government as a big corporations, probably at some point they will need to have the uh, chief officer of the digital transformation as well as the committee who will be deciding on the strategy for the country and what strategy will be implemented and what are the risks for the country. So I, uh, I'm i looking from this perspective. Yeah. What is uh, the first, what you think, what are the top three risks? If you would just prioritize them for the, the logistic companies, top three risks on their wave of the digital transformation. You know, uh, I think the top risk is, is always about people, okay? Um, despite of the sector. Um, we need to think about careers, career transition, uh, job description, um, human resources readiness to deal with that. Um, uh, digital transformation is a big change management environment. So it's about people, it's about culture, um, it's about uh, retaining the, the, the good values of the company. Um, it's about having the right people to, to foresee the business opportunities, to be able to, to, to draw um, the DT roadmap and then to implement it. So um, the, the one big risk is, is always about people and how the board of directors will uh, deal with that. What's the job description that will be shaped to hire your next human resources vice president? And how people will be rewarded? And what are the risks um, related to different areas? I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there is a, a large uh, agricultural company, uh, John Deere, they started uh, adding sensors in their equipment. So they are, when they're on their fields, they are doing, you know, seeding, uh, cropping, whatever, they capture data. Uh, it, it sounds a very um, operational perspective, but the data captured during uh, uh, the usage of, during the use of the equipment, they will, um, they will tell about the speed, the weather conditions, um, the driver, the soil inclination, what type of crop you're using. And all data, all this data will go to the um, uh, R&D department. The R&D department will use this to develop a new version of this equipment. All right, where? the best R&D professionals will go to. They will go to those companies that are in the border of the knowledge, that are trying new things. And therefore you attract the best. It's not about going through digital transformation or not. My company will not be as attractive as my competitor. And I will lose people. And how do I not lose people? And I put this agenda together. Uh, one more point. How do I not create stress? How, how, how do I make people feel comfortable? They will complete the journey with us without losing their job or um, being fired. Or um, should I train them, prepare them? Um, how digital literacy will go down from this conceptual level to the um, to the job to, to, to the year plan uh, goals of each employee, uh, it's really important. So one large risk is people. The second, two other two. You ask for three. I'll say two that go together: strategy and reputation. Okay, um, strategy risk the, the the ability to understand what to do now and the impacts in the long term. Here you have the strategy risk and reputation. Um, we are now exposed. There is, not, uh, the re there is no longer a relationship with one customer. There is a relationship with a customer network. 
So if one of them are not happy, if one of them is unhappy, um, the whole network will know about that. So strategy and reputation come just after people uh, risks. Thank you, excellent, excellent. Okay, uh, further, okay, we identified the risks and we know where are the major risks. Do we have the same approach for the risk management as we do in the project management step by step, or it should be something of different, more agile? How, how do you recommend to deal with those risks? You know, I, I really believe there is room for uh, everything. Um, if you are a, a digital transformation leader and you have just arrived within your company, and you must um, reassess all risks and you, you, you are there to draw a program, a, 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 a bunch of projects, right? So you, you need a program of projects. Um, you, you're not using agile techniques at this moment. Um, one very, very important aspect of digital transformation um, is the communication plan which is so very clear in, in the PMI structure. So um, how do we communicate uh, properly? When you think about, um, for example, cybersecurity risks, um, you, you think about assets and identification management, you think about incident response plan, but you think also about communication plan. Who must know about what, when, and how, and this is so solid in, in the PMI structure, in the PMI body of knowledge. So um, then you, you need to have a long-term structure. Um, with, my, with my students or customers, whatever, um, we, we discuss the idea of the center of excellence, which is a, a bunch of guys. Each one will know different skills and abilities. There will be the sponsor, the leader, the, the software art, the solution architect, architect, the manager. Um, the center of excellence is about managing people and managing people in very complex projects and uh, a sequence of projects. Okay, now we may have a blend from traditional PMI body of knowledge and um, several more recent techniques You'll have the, the, your squad running sprints and in a agile approach. So they do not conflict, okay? When we decide what to do in detail, we can think agile, but the, 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 the digital transformation um, uh, broad perspective strategy, uh, it's a long-term view. It, it's more about Think what we expect for this company in the following two, three, five, ten years. That, that's not really a agile-like approach. So I, I believe there is room for everything. So uh, as I understand the, the, the concept of contingency reserve and management reserve doesn't go away, but it stays. And we may even have some more digital management reserves because it will have risks that are known, but still some unknown unknown risks. You are, we are not aware because we are in this field the first time. So we may come up with some risks that we have never thought of. So it's it's really interesting. Uh, I think we have question here and I will encourage others also to come up with the question. Georgi, question, is there any specific network that you can recommend or you know of uh, digital transformation officers where they can exchange the information? Is there any type of network? Uh, well, well I, I lead one of them. <laughs> Uh, there is a group in LinkedIn, is uh, the Digital Transformation Group. Mm -hmm. uh, in my presentation, there was a uh, QR code. Mm -hmm. I will share the presentation afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. And we, we are, I guess, uh, 35,000 or 36,000 members in there. So mm -hmm. it's a very large group. 
and there is room for a very different approach. So uh, if you go in, on LinkedIn, it's the digital transformation group. Okay, it's it's a, a pretty useful source of knowledge. Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Alexander. Uh, which company in the world from logistic and supply chain management, the top three digital savvy companies, you, you believe that they are up to speed with the digital transformation. I understand that the corporation to make the digital transformation, it takes lots of effort. Yes, but okay. if we will just still. Okay. Um... I'll try to be fair here and not to enhance any of them, okay? Uh, during the presentation, I mentioned uh, Maersk, which is a uh, huge, large um, maritime uh, company, okay? Uh, they have very solid initiatives related to the use of IoT, um, robotic process automation, RPA, machine learning and blockchain, okay? So they, they have very good use case on that. A second company that also have very good use cases is DHL. DHL, they, they have uh, pilot sites to test a variety of uh, solutions, especially within the, the environment of distribution centers. Um, they have run many, many, many tests on the use of uh, augmented reality um, with several different, with several devices, um, what we call um, head mounting devices, uh, HMD. It's like a helmet with a, a screen, but also with glasses and the, they are, um, I would say, they are one step ahead of the others in this type of technologies. And also a very good reference. Um, and they also promote themselves, mark themselves very well around this. And one third example uh, I like to mention is uh, UPS, especially in, in the United States. UPS is now working together with SAP to develop a module to manage data related to the process of uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing. And UPS is um, differently from the AGL that has a, a blend of warehousing and transportation. UPS is, is really focused on the transportation mode. And people usually think, okay, UPS is studying 3D printing because they want a printer in the truck so they print while they move now that, that's not the case because the the 3d printing does not allow any any the lightest oscillation um will impede um the the precision uh printing okay but they want to provide uh 3pl solutions i will have a uh, 3d printing farm that's how we call with uh, 200, 600, 1,000 printers. It's a, a 3D printing farm. And this will be located close to an industrial area. And one of the customers will ask for that. I will print and then quickly do, for example, the last mile or something equivalent to that, deliver the piece that has just been printed. And the uh, UPS and SAP are working how to create a module on SAP to be uh, offered to the SAP clients, therefore request this type of model. So there are many companies, each of them uh, trying different things. Maersk, DHL, and UPS are three good examples. They are biggest and probably the innovators in their field. And this is amazing how fast and how innovative they are. And probably for the smaller companies, it's a big uh, challenge to catch up with them. But the smaller com companies uh, also have uh, um, uh, their advantages uh, of being more flexible. 
uh, so uh, it's also probably um, uh, good. What do you think? How should the the people around those logistic and supply companies should adapt to those changes to to those digital transformation? Because the people who are the consumers. Yeah, the individuals, they also have to adapt and they also need to be digitally savvy and lit they have to have literacy on that. What do you think, how quickly they can adapt to those? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, around the globe, the, the, the business environment is full of very small service providers that we uh, sometime agreed to name them startups. So we have hundreds and thousands of startups. Uh, this is usually a one-man company, a two, one man, one woman, okay? So a, a two people company, three people company, uh, and that's it. And, and what do they have? They have the knowledge. We, we are in the knowledge economy, okay? That's how things work. Uh, someone who knows something, they can pack it, bundle it, and offer it as a service or as a product. And we have many of them. All right. So I am a very small service provider. I am a uh, um, 3PL. I store for you. I deliver for you. But I have a regional uh, coverage. And I want to get into this world of digital transformation. OK. What could I do? This company usually will have a software to manage their warehouse that is known as warehouse management system. A warehouse management system will have parameters. Oh, when this good arrives, I will store it there or further in the end of the area, or I will store here closer to the docks. There are many parameters. And those parameters are updated, uh, well, once, during the startup of the WMS, and then ideally once a year. All right, this um, smaller service provider, logistics service provider, could hire one small startup, which is a budget approach, um, very knowledgeable people, but a budget approach, and say, listen, I want to have a, a machine learning routine here to capture data from my forecast and for my future receipts, and then to automatically re-parameterize my WMS. I will not replace the system, but I'll make the machine learning solution work together with the WMS. So for the next truck that is arriving, I will have an updated view of the environment and know the best place to allocate uh, this good, either closer to the docks or further to the end if I'm not uh, uh, using this in one um, in one uh, of my uh, shipping very soon. So uh, there is always a way to, to drive into digital fluency. You can have it bold, solid, massive approach like uh, McDonald's that bought a $300 million artificial intelligence company, or you can go budget hiring a one, call, one guy startup to update your WMS. There are many possibilities. Amazing. And actually, every time I have expert on my session and we talk about digital transformation, every time I'm amazed about the possibilities and opportunities we have right now and we will have in future. So it's amazing. And we are up to one hour. I think we could talk and talk about things and I will ask and ask more and more questions, but we are limited in the time and we have to stick to our uh, schedule. Uh, it was really my honor to host you uh, here because actually Georgia is uh, in the place where we can be a logistic road. Uh, so um, I'm really thankful uh, for this interesting presentation. And I would like to let everybody uh, attending this session that we will be hosting uh, another really interesting sessions uh, in the nearest future. You, uh, 
uh, you have the agenda and you will receive the invitation to those sessions and we will continue talking about the digital transformation we we'll continue to talk about the the project management and the role of the project manager very interesting session next week we will have about remote sales uh, for project managers because we do sales everybody does sales in their everyday life job so uh, please feel free to join and see you soon see you next week thank you alexandra thank you everybody for attending bye bye thank you very much guys